In the previous video, we discussed spontaneous collapse theories, and I established that in GRW theory, which is sort of the main spontaneous collapse theory, broadly speaking, there are three additions to quantum mechanics. These are that the collapse occurs in a region about 10 to the negative 7 meters. The collapses occur for a single particle at a rate of about once every 300 million years, and that collapses occur spontaneously and stochastically. So these additions probably immediately raise the following three questions. So one, why does the collapse occur in a region specifically the size of 10 to the negative 7 meters? Why do collapses occur for a single particle at a rate of once every 300 million years? And what, if anything, causes the collapse to occur? So the answers to questions one and two come from what are called phenomenological considerations. To put this simply, these values are arrived at because they will make the theory agree with observation. So we know what type of observations we make, and so the theory has to fit those observations. And so they come up with these values based on making the theory fit with these observations. So while this can seem ad hoc, it is not as uncommon as you might think. So things like dark matter and dark energy are arrived at by similar means. So dark matter, for instance, we see that there is something going on with gravity out in the universe, and so they posit that there must be some kind of matter out there that we can't see and that we don't have any real theories of yet. And so that is a phenomenological consideration. We know the observations we're making, and so we have to posit something in order to make our theory fit with the observations. And so you might have heard of things like modified Newtonian gravity or dark matter or things like that. Those are all theories that come from these phenomenological considerations. So even though it does seem, at least to me, a little bit ad hoc, this is something that does occur. So that collapses occur in a region of 10 to the negative 7 meters. The reason that they come up with this number here is because it means that we have the macroscopic objects that we observe in our everyday lives, while not restricting the observations of, say, electrons in an atom to behave macroscopically. So it's at a good size there, essentially, that we can have our macroscopic objects while still observing quantum phenomena. So in other words, 10 to the negative 7 meters is small enough that we will not notice the Brownian motion of particles collapsing in macroscopic objects. So, and we'll talk about this more in the next video about how when we have many particles, the collapses are actually happening a lot more often, but it's still happening in finite time. And so you would see sort of a Brownian motion. In fact, that's what they often call it, a sort of Brownian motion of the particle collapsing here and there within a small area. And so we don't want to be able to see that in macroscopic objects, so this number here, this 10 to the negative 7 meters, is small enough that we would not see that in macroscopic objects. But it's large enough that the quantum effects observed in atoms and molecules will not be violated. So the electrons will still exist in a cloud of localizations within the orbital. Similarly, that collapses occur at a rate of every 300 million years for a single particle, ensures that experiments on single particles, such as double-slit experiments, will still show quantum effects, such as interference, since it is extremely unlikely that even a single particle will suffer a localization in the time it takes the particle to be measured. So if we have our photon emitter right here, it's emitting photons, it's going through both of these slits and we get this interference pattern. And so the time it takes for the photon to get from here to the screen here, or even an electron if we're using electrons, the time it takes for that to happen is going to be so much shorter than 300 million years that we will not notice that very many of the particles are collapsing before they hit the sensor over here. And so that allows us to actually get the quantum phenomena in our experiments that we are used to seeing, that we know that we should be seeing. Yet, as we'll see in the next video, this 
3 times 10 to the 8 years, this 300 million years, is actually for n particles, tau over n. And so this should actually be, instead of just years, it should be years per particle. And like I said, I'll talk about this a lot more in the next video, but it means that with more particles, this occurs more often to the point that macroscopic objects of size 10 to the 23 particles have spontaneous localizations about once every 30 nanoseconds. With entanglement, as I'll talk about in the next video, this allows for macroscopic objects such as cats to avoid existing in superpositions, at least in time scales that we would be able to notice in our everyday lives. And so that's why this 300 million year time span is arrived at, because it allows for when we have these macroscopic objects that we don't see these superpositions, but when we have just a single particle, such as up here, we do see those phenomena. And so those are the phenomenological considerations. So the point here being that these two values, this 10 to the negative 7 meters and this 300 million years per particle, arise simply because they allow the theory to agree with observation. So these values would then need to be considered new constants of nature. And this is one of the ontological commitments that this theory is going to have to make. And probably one of the weaknesses of the theory is that we have to posit these two new constants of nature. There are disagreements about what these values ought to be. So, for instance, as Girardi puts it in his Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article on this subject, he says, concerning the choice of our sigma and our tau here parameters of the model, it has to be stressed that, as it is obvious, the just mentioned transition from micro to macro. So like I was saying, we're saying that on the micro scale, we can see these quantum phenomena, but on the macro scale, we don't. And this theory allows for a nice transition there. So he says that the transitions here from the micro to the macro depends crucially on the values of our sigma and tau. Departing from the original choice of GRW, Adler in 2003, has suggested to increase the value of f, where Girardi here is using f for what we were using lambda for, by a factor of the order of 10 to the 9. The reason for this derived from requiring that during latent image formation and photography, the collapse becomes effective right after a grain of the emulsion has been excited. This is equivalent to requiring that when a human eye is hit by a few photons, the perceptual threshold being very low, reduction takes place in the rods of the eye. As we will discuss in what follows, if one takes the original GRW value for F, reduction cannot occur in the rods because of relatively a small number of molecules, less than 10 to the fifth are affected, but only during the transmission along the nervous signal within the brain, a process which involves the displacement of a number of ions on the order of 10 to the 12. And so he's saying there are too few particles here in order for a localization to occur in a given time. So we have photons hitting the rods in the eye, and it's saying that we don't have enough particles, enough rods in the eye, in order for a localization to occur. And so the particle would still be in a superposition when that happens. But then Girardi goes on to say, it is interesting to remark that the drastic change suggested by Adler has physical implications which have already been experimentally falsified. And so, as mentioned, the GRW theory posits these values for sigma and tau as new physical constants. As such, it does not propose any sort of mechanism for what caused the collapse. They are simply stochastic and spontaneous, but as ontologically primitive as, say, the mass of an electron. But another collapse theory, however, proposes that gravity is the cause of these collapses. So as the Wikipedia article on objective collapse theories puts it, Diossi and Penrose, so Roger Penrose, formulated the idea that gravity is responsible for the collapse of the wave function. Penrose argued that in a quantum gravity scenario where a spatial superposition creates the superposition of two different space-time curvatures, 
Gravity does not tolerate such superpositions and spontaneously collapses them. He also provided a phenomenological formula for the collapse time. Independently and prior to Penrose, DOC presented a dynamical model that collapses the wave function with the same time scale suggested by Penrose. And so this mechanism here has the time between collapses given by the Heisenberg time energy uncertainty, which is right here, where this delta E here is going to be equal to this, where we have this difference between gravitational accelerations. So these are the gravitational acceleration. This is the difference between them in a superposition of gravitational fields. So this E sub G here is essentially the difference between two space-time curvatures, where if the difference is too large, we get an undefined space-time metric. The two systems therefore belong to two different Hilbert spaces, and that means they cannot be superposed and will result in a collapse to just one of them. So that is one possible mechanism for these collapses. As I said, the original GRW would just posit the collapses as spontaneous and stochastic, so there isn't really a mechanism. It's just sort of ontologically primitive that it happens. But this Penrose one here says that gravity could be causing these collapses. Another one that I came across a while back is from philosopher Elvin Plantiga, which in his book about religion and science titled Where the Conflict Really Lies, posits that these spontaneous collapses could conceivably be caused by God. He calls this divine collapse causation. And the reason he posits this is because he wants to have a scientific explanation for how miracles might occur. So he says that when a miracle occurs, the divine intervention in question is God causing spontaneous collapse of particles into extremely low probability positions. But what happens if we look at a particular example of a miracle, which is attested to in the Bible, for instance? So Plantinga is a Christian philosopher, and so he uses Christianity quite often when he is talking about religion. So, for instance, we can think of the transubstantiation of water into wine. So I'll assume that we just have one mole of molecules, so 10 to the 23 molecules, of pure water without any exotic isotopes, without anything else in it besides just water. So this would come out to about 1.7 times 10 to the 24 subatomic particles, ignoring electrons since those will have a negligible effect. And for simplicity, I'll say that wine is composed of 86% water, 12% ethanol, and 2% of sugars and other carbohydrates. This means that wine contains carbon, which is six protons and six neutrons each, which pure water does not contain. This means that we will either need hydrogen to undergo fusion or oxygen to undergo fission in order to produce carbon. So along with planting out, we can assume that this occurs via spontaneous collapse into improbable positions, so areas in the tails of our Gaussian curves, essentially. So for instance, we could have six hydrogen nuclei spontaneously collapse into positions of close enough proximity to become trapped by the strong nuclear force, and therefore form carbon nuclei. Or we could have the protons and neutrons from oxygen spontaneously collapse into positions far enough away from the oxygen nucleus to escape the attraction of the strong nuclear force. So this latter case simplifies things since we can use the escaping protons from oxygen to produce some of the extra hydrogen or deuterium that we need for our ethanol and carbohydrates. So what I'm saying is essentially what I'm showing here. We have this this is our oxygen nucleus right here. These two proton-neutron pairs here spontaneously collapse outside of this nucleus so that we end up with a carbon nucleus right here and two deuterium nuclei coming off of it. So with our sample of 100% water turning into something like 86% water while maintaining our volume of liquid, we would need to have 14% of the water undergo a change into ethanol and sugar. If we assume the fission of one oxygen to produce one carbon plus two hydrogen, this means that 1.4 times 10 to the 22 oxygens would undergo fission. 
In other words, we would have 1.4 times 10 to the 22 fission events. If we say that the energy needed to do this is the reverse of the CNO cycle, and then for simplification, we round the energy per fission event down. So I'm actually rounding down here in the energy and say that it requires 20 mega electron volts or 3.2 times 10 to the negative 12 joules for each full fission event from one atom of oxygen to one atom of carbon. Then turning our one mole of water into wine would require this. So we have 3.2 times negative 12 joules per fission event times 1.4 times 10 to the 22 fissions equals 4.2 times 10 to the 10 joules. This is an order of magnitude more energy than is released by one ton of TNT. So one ton of TNT releases about 4.184 times 10 to the 9 joules. The way we are doing this though, we are doing fission on light nuclei. And so this is actually going to require energy to do. And so in other words, all the energy being drawn into this transubstantiation will cause the surroundings to get extremely cold, to make an understatement, as energy, in fact, this much energy right here, is drawn in by the change once the protons and neutrons escape by the attraction of the strong nuclear force by spontaneously appearing outside the nucleus via spontaneous collapse, energy will be drawn into the nuclei to bring them up to the higher energy level of the carbon nuclei relative to the oxygen nuclei. If we went the other way and instead generated our carbon by fusion of hydrogen, we would have the opposite effect, a powerful explosion. And this analysis is ignoring radioactive decays, particularly the beta and gamma decays, that would likely result from these nuclear reactions. So these phenomena, either a flash freezing everywhere around the water turned into wine, or a massive explosion, were not reported in the account of Jesus turning water into wine, which means we ought to be skeptical of the GRW localizations being behind this putative miracle. But anyway, that was everything I wanted to talk about in this video. The main take-homes here are that these two things, that the collapse occur in a region of size 10 to the negative 7 meters, and that the collapses occur at a rate of once every 300 million years. These were arrived at by phenomenological considerations, and in the normal GRW theory, these collapses are just spontaneous and stochastic, so there isn't any sort of underlying mechanism. But there are theories like Penrose's theory that do posit a mechanism for this. But anyway, I hope you found this video interesting, and I will see you in the next one.